Chapter 8 continues with fan theory. Before we get into those details, our eventual goal from this chapter is to identify different types of solids. There are metallic solids composed of metals, ionic solids composed of metals and nonmetals or polyatomic ions, network covalent solids, which will be discussed soon, and molecular solids, which are composed of nonmetals. Our goal will be to identify what kind of solid is present and rank them in relative melting point. Metallic melting points have a wide variety from low to high. Ionic solids almost always have high melting points, as do network covalent solids. Molecular solids have low melting points relative to ionic and network covalent solids. That's because molecular forces, which are dispersion, dipole, and H bonding, are weak compared to ionic and network covalent forces. In order to explain band theory, I'm going to remind you of molecular orbital theory. Band theory is like MO theory, but it's for metals. You may remember when combining unhybridized p orbitals, the mixture of molecular orbitals creates bonding and empty antibonding orbitals. Band theory is much the same. If we start with the valence energy level of one atomic orbital, it may be at a particular energy. When two atoms get together, we'll get a bonding orbital full of electrons and antibonding orbitals that do not have electrons in them. We can continue with four atoms, eight atoms, 16 atoms, and what I hope you notice is that the band gap between the valence electrons and the empty orbitals is shrinking the more we add atoms. So if we have Avogadro's number of atoms, we will get a band of orbitals full of electrons, and a continuous band of orbitals that are empty of electrons, hence the name band theory. Most metallic solids tend to be conductors. So the valence band, which is full of electrons, is full right up to the Fermi level. The Fermi level you can think of as the highest occupied molecular orbital. The conduction band is mostly empty, except for those few electrons that have been excited and are able to reach the conduction band. As you might imagine, these are the electrons that are mobile and move, allowing electricity to be transmitted. The energy gap between the Fermi level and the conduction band is zero for conductors. There might also be two bands if s and p orbitals have overlaps, but still you notice there are electrons in the valence band and a conduction band with a band gap of zero. Things that are conductors would be copper, tungsten, silver, or zinc. Semiconductors have the same arrangement except for a small band gap. You notice that there is an energy gap between the Fermi level and the conduction band. Semiconductors would be materials like silicon, gallium phosphide, or zinc sulfide. Here's a quick segue into how semiconductors are made. They're based on silicon, but with small amounts of other elements. N-type semiconductors are those that have a tiny amount of material from group 5 on the periodic table. This means that they have an extra electron. What that does is changes the gap from the valence band to the conduction band from something that's very hard to jump at room temperature to adding this extra electron with energy levels that are close to the conduction band such that we have a small band gap between the Fermi level and the conduction band. Doping with group five materials raises the Fermi level. Another way to create a semiconductor is to make a p-type semiconductor. This is by adding a tiny amount of material from group three of the periodic table to our silicon. So instead of having four electrons like silicon, 
We have three electrons in the valence band, and this creates an empty part of the conduction band. So p-type semiconductors function by lowering the empty valence orbitals such that, again, the gap between the Fermi level and the conduction band can be jumped by an electron at room temperature. The last band diagram I have for you is that for insulators, things like rubber or glass. You notice that the gap between the valence band and the conduction band is a great amount of energy, enough energy that electrons cannot easily jump this gap and transmit electricity along the conduction band. Here's just a quick detour into conductivity and temperature. One reason semiconductors can be more interesting than conductors is, as the temperature increases, conductivity of semiconductors will increase to a point, whereas the conductivity of many conductors decreases with increasing temperature. Insulators, if you heat them enough, will eventually start to conduct electricity, but the material will be destroyed as it does so with the glass melting or the rubber burning. So what interparticular forces hold metallic solids together? This would be the attraction between oppositely charged entities. The interparticular force for metals is known as metallic bonds, and you can consider metals to be cations in a liquid sea of valence electrons. Remember that most metals have low ionization energy, so those electrons are very loosely attracted to the nucleus. The melting points of metals can range from low to high. Most metals are a solid at room temperature, but mercury is a liquid. So here are your student questions. Which picture below is the band diagram for a semiconductor? For this diagram, where the red area is full of electrons and the blue area has mostly empty orbitals, where is the Fermi level? You might also try to identify the valence band and the conduction band.